What's it like to attend Columbia Medical? Why did this newly minted doc also earn an MPH? And how did he co-found a student organization to help serve New York City's needs and help med students at Columbia volunteer? That's what we're going to find out. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Welcome to the 374th episode of Admission Straight Talk. Thank you so much for tuning in. Now, I rarely plug Accepted services on the podcast, but I can't resist today. During these unprecedented times, except it is doing something we've never done before. Starting tomorrow, July 15th, and ending on July 21st, we are having a price rollback. Yes, you heard me correctly. This is your opportunity to purchase Accepted's outstanding admissions packages, advising, editing, interview prep, or whatever you need at, at 2017 prices. During the rollback, just go to www.accepted.com. Put the service you need in your shopping cart and you'll see the prices that you can pay during this unprecedented price rollback. Prices go back to 2020 levels on July 22nd, so don't delay. Our guest today is Dr. David Edelman, co-founder and past co-chair of the COVID-19 Student Service Corps. Dr. Edelman earned his bachelor's degree in biology and Spanish from Washington University in St. Louis in 2015. He then began his medical school studies at Columbia University's Vagelos College of Physicians and Surgeons. And while there, he also earned an MPH at Columbia's Melman School of Public Health. He is about to start his residency at Montefiore Medical Center in its primary care social internal medicine program. Dr. Edelman, or I don't know if I should call you Dr. Edelman or David for purposes of this interview. David is totally fine. <laughs> okay. I'm probably, probably just getting used to the doctor part, huh? Oh, yeah. I haven't even used it officially yet. All right. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, and congratulations on becoming a doctor. I know you just graduated. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. You're very welcome. Okay. Glad you could join us. Can you tell us about your background outside of medicine, where you grew up, what you like to do for fun, that kind of stuff? Absolutely. I'm uh, originally from a small suburb outside of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, mm. I grew up there, played a lot of sports growing up, uh, and then left the nest um, to go to undergraduate um, in St. Louis at Washington University. Um, continued on with sports for a little bit there. I, I played football for a year, um, was on the uh, club baseball team for a while, and then really found uh, interests in, in um, Spanish language, which I studied abroad a little bit in Spain and, and just loved uh, being in a different place and being on my own and uh, learning about language and culture and people, um, as well as global health and the intersections between um, health and equity in the United States and, and abroad. Um, things I like to do for fun. I've gotten into running over the last five years. I love hiking. Uh, I have a dog who's here with me since I haven't started residency. I'm able to sp been spending a lot of time with my dog. Um, <laughs> and uh, I also um, host a, a, a weekly trivia question for friends and family as a way to stay in touch over the last few years, which has been really fun. So those are kind of my, my little quirky things I like to do. That is fun. And uh, does your dog like to run also? She does. She does. <laughs> That's she good. Runner, <laughs> loves being outside. It makes it easy to get outside. That's for sure. Okay. When did you decide to become a doctor or what experiences led you to that decision? It was a building process. I think the, the first moment um, was in high school. I think it really speaks to how um, the teachers that you have really make a difference on what you do in life. Uh, I was in a biology class and uh, the, the teacher I had in 10th in grade, Mr. Grimm, was just such a phenomenal, um, inspiring person who really, you know, it's, it's sort of cliche, but he, he made all the science come alive. And it's not because we were, you know, dissecting animals or anything, but because he really connected everything that we were learning in such a, a fun, fundamental way um, to how we live and breathe and act as people. Um, and that got me interested in it. Um, the only physician in my family is my uncle. And uh, when I was telling him about how much I loved it, that class in 10th grade, he said, why don't you come down to my hospital one night and you can shadow in the emergency room. So I Whoa. first ever experience in medicine was 
on a Friday night in downtown Cleveland in the level one trauma center uh, from like 8 p.m. to 2 a.m. And I, I think even, you know, how many years later, 11 years later, uh, that was still the, the most jam-packed night of medicine I've ever had. Wow. And I saw more in those six hours than I think I've seen in week-long periods um, ever since. So it was, it was a pretty cool intro. And from there, I knew I wanted to do something in medicine and um, kept growing as I kept exploring more uh, of how I saw myself in that world. What were some of the more impactful experiences that you had as you explored medicine before medical school? So I think there were a number of things. I mean, when I think of what led me to where I am now, and, and that includes going into a primary care residency program and, and integrating medicine and public health through social medicine, um, I think about sort of these converging threads of my life. Um, that was sort of the medicine thread. Uh, but then there's also the thread about meeting people and going to places. And um, it, it started really early, uh, this fascination with the fact that people spoke languages I didn't understand. And so it was very concrete. It was very much a, you could open up a video, a board game. Like I, we would used to sit on the ground when my grandfather came over to babysit. We would open up the board game instructions and compare the Spanish language instructions to the English ones. And I was so fascinated that there were these words and languages. And, and it grew from that concrete um, interest in, in different languages to really understanding that people experience life differently than I did. Um, and uh, that grew to learning more about the language and the culture that grew to understanding the broad, broad view of how humanity really is so different all over the world. Um, and then trying to see um, that as it combined with medicine brought me to some experiences in global health and then um, in St. Louis working at a place called Casa de Salud, um, which was a, a free uh, low cost clinic for um, particularly underinsured or uninsured uh, immigrants in the region. Um, and it, it really started to connect all these dots together um, and, and bring forth the idea of, uh, you know, I like medicine, I like helping people, I've seen medicine in different spaces. I also find it really important to learn about and learn from other people to be humble about oneself and putting those two together and seeing how I can make a difference and an impact in the world um, through a career that I love. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful motivation. What was the hardest part of the medical school application process for you? I realize the residency one is much more recent, but how about the medical school one? Well, the, the irony is that the residency process is a breeze compared to the medical school process. Um, the, the hardest part, I think, uh, is the marathon. Um, I, I think, really, if you know early you want to go to medical school, I mean, that process starts even before junior year, whatever the typical flying time is. I mean, that process is starting throughout all of college, and there's this pressure, and there's, you know, things that are, at least at the time, I consider checkboxes, which really should have been more passion projects. Um, and then there's the, the looming uh, MCAT. There's, even when you're done with all that and you think you're ready, you know, you've submitted the application, there's a whole season of secondaries. I mean, it just <laughs> kept piling on. And honestly, the part that felt the worst at the time was the waiting, um, which just is ridiculous because of all the work that had to go into it. But it's so true because it just kept getting drawn out. And so I think that the hardest part was just trying to keep a positive mindset at, at all times, or as, at, at least have a frame that I could go back into and being able to separate from the whole process and step back and really take, you know, an internal look at myself and, and enjoy life outside of that process. How did you maintain that positive frame of mind? Um, I think it was finding things that made me whole, um, which is a almost cliched thing to say now, uh, but it's something that I hold true even today. Uh, you know, going like what? Going to play pickup basketball with friends, okay. you know, going outside, going on hikes, going on walks, trying to get out, um, really just trying to distance from what the day to day was. I think there's, it's easy to fall into that trap of always talking about the same things, the med school process or, or orgo tests, you know, whatever else is going on in college related to pre med. But I think being able to step outside of that is really important. Well, obviously, you did very well in the medical school application process, you got into Columbia Medical School. What did you like best about your experience there? Uh, I loved the people. Um, the people who are at Columbia are just tremendous. They are in, this incredibly diverse group 
from all walks of life with all kinds of experiences. And I went straight through from college to undergrad, or from, I'm sorry, from college to medical school. And it was very intimidating for me um, being 22 years old and meeting now one of my good friends who at the time was you know, 35 uh, and had worked 15 years in global health. And, and I kind of saw that at the time, this is what I want to do in life and you've already done it. Um, and, and that was really tough, but I learned so much from him and I learned so much from all my other peers who were Olympic athletes and you know, uh, who worked in finance and who had jobs for 10 years or a journalist all these different things, I think it actually really opened my eyes even far more than what I did in college into the fact that doing things outside of medicine makes you better in medicine. Um, and that's a big thing I have now about the patients I want to, to care for in the future is to care well for them, I have to do things that are away from actually caring for them. I guess that's something you're going to have to deal with in residency, which you're about to start in, in a week. But maybe, maybe we'll talk about that a little later in, in the call. What, what do you think could be improved at Columbia Medical School? Well, it's, you know, it's a great question. I think that uh, it comes at a time where uh, all institutions are really reckoning with what is their role um, in structures of, of racism and, and looking to strive for better equity. I think um, Columbia is such a strong, well-regarded institution that there's a lot of power for them to uh, develop um, really intimate uh, community partnerships that build among the communities in which they're located. Sure. And the Columbia, the undergraduate is located in Morningside Heights, which is uh, just north of the Upper West Side um, in Manhattan. Columbia- It's very close to Harlem. It's very close to Harlem. Um, and the medical school is located in Washington Heights, uh, which is a predominantly Dominican neighborhood. Um, and so uh, being near Harlem on the Morningside campus and being near Washington Heights and the medical campus, um, there are a lot of communities um, that are, well, being gentrified, but also that have been there a long time and have many needs. And I think that um, any institution that's situated in these areas should really look to see how they can support, but really to make it a priority. Um, not to say that Columbia hasn't, but uh, I think now as we reckon with um, how our institutions um, sit idly by and contribute to perpetuate a lot of um, some structures of injustice uh, that we can use our collective strength and money and power um, to improve and create a more equitable um, region and, and life for so many people. Do you feel that Colombia has kind of fallen short on that? Or I think more? it's a failure of all higher, um, in higher institutions of higher ed. Um, I think uh, one thing that was really beautiful coming out of the, the COVID work that we did, which I know we'll talk about, um, was strengthening community partnerships that hadn't existed across the medical center, but had maybe existed in silos. Um, and so one of the things about the medical center in Washington Heights is the, the public health school, the school of public health, the medical school, the dental school, and um, the nursing school are all there. Uh, but all of them kind of exist in their own little bubbles. And having gone both in the medical school and public health, I really saw how these worlds did and did not interact. And so some schools had stronger community partnerships with some community-based organizations than others did. And I think that our response sort of broke down these barriers and, and fairly rapidly said, how do we improve this? Because this is a problem. Um, and so I think that the thing to improve for, for my institution where I came from, for really all institutions is, how do we work with community partners and, and build better communities in the places where we're situated now? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, now you also got an MPH. We've talked about it a little bit. Why did you want an MPH in addition to the MD? Well, I actually going into the medical school application process knew that I likely wanted to do it um, because even at that time, I knew that my interests in health um, and in medicine were more about access to care um, and what I didn't know at the time, but would now call would be social determinants of health and health equity and social justice. Um, and I saw that public health was really the avenue where this was happening. Um, and so when I was applying, I actually looked at a lot of schools that had strong public health schools. And even in Columbia, they, they ask a question, their, their secondary, is there anything else you want to know? And I wrote about, I want to go to Mailman and do my MPH while I'm there. Um, so, I, you know, I knew it was something I wanted to do because I knew that my practice of medicine in the future was not going to be medicine alone. It was going to be 
medicine and public health, medicine and community-based health partnerships, health equity, social determinants, research, all of that that goes together. Okay, great. Makes sense. Now let's turn to the organizations that you led while you were at Columbia. First, the Public Health Commute. What is it and how did you become co-director of it? Yeah, the Public Health Commute. Um, actually, I mentioned my friend who I met uh, the mm-hmm. first you know, week of medical school who was 15 years old than me. So he was one of the people who has helped start and, and run this project. And, and he came to me um, midway through my public health year and said, David, I, I would love to have you on board and help me out. Um, this project is something that's really what you're interested in. It's about bringing public health to medicine. And I said, sign me up. This sounds awesome. So it was started in uh, 2017 by a medical student at the time who also had gone and um, gotten her MPH at at, uh, the Mailman School. And she did it as, uh, after seeing that there was this real gap of public health education that was happening in medicine. Um, And she wanted to create something that would help students particularly in their clinical rotations, understand some of the underlying social issues that led to patients presenting with illness. And this was particularly for students going to rotations, not at the, our home hospital in Washington Heights, but in places like Harlem or in Stanford, Connecticut, where we have a partner um, institution. And so she created these uh, online quick, like they call, we call them syllabi, where students could go through and read about, you know, what are the patient populations? What is gun violence? What is racism? How does this affect health? Really introductory and fundamental public health concepts that affect people's health and why they come to the hospital. So she graduated and and actually stayed at Columbia and handed this project down to Greg, who then invited me to come along um, and really expand it. Greg took this and ran with it on the clinical side, and I was overseeing the formation of everything preclinical. And so what I did was I built interactive modules that are online. Um, It's at publichealthcommute.com. And you can walk through a case, sometimes a couple cases of patients that are presenting to some sort of clinical scenario uh, and underlying public health concepts that are really guiding why they're there and and what's happening. Uh, And the idea was that each of these would be matched to what's being taught in the medical school curriculum. And for each block that a medical student goes through in the first year and a half, they have a public health thread that gets woven in between. Um, And this really was designed to be uh, a proof of concept in a way. So we showed that, or we're showing that they can be paired with each block and that students will engage and enjoy them, which they really have, and learn something from it about fundamental public health concepts. And then it'll be more formally integrated into the curriculum as they start to look into how do we bring public health into everything that we teach, which was really my goal. And is... Is the idea of commute that they can they can do this on a commute while they're on the train? That's, that's where the name came from. Yeah. Was, you know, was these rotations where people might have to take the train. So, you know, learn okay. some public health on your commute. Great. Okay, that's very good. Very interesting. Fascinating. And now let's turn to the COVID-19 Student Service Corps. How did you come to find it? Well, found it rather, not find it, well, found it. And what's the backstory to it? So COVID started in in New York City. I think the first confirmed case was sometime around the March 1st or 3rd. Um, And for the five years I was in Columbia, um, I I worked at one of the student-run preclinics. It was every Tuesday. Um, And so the, the the first Tuesday in March, we had a clinic, and it was a little chaotic because we knew that there was a case of COVID, and all of these new guidelines were coming out about screening people. And our clinic was in the basement of a church in Harlem. Uh, It does not have good infection control processes by any measure, because it's not a clinical space and that's intentional. Um, And so we were kind of scrambling to figure out what we're gonna do. Uh, And in the next 24 to 48 hours after our clinic, uh, we learned that all of the student run free clinics at Columbia were gonna be shut down for reasons related to uh, patient safety, infection control and student safety. Um, And at the time there was a lot of of emotion. Uh, There's, a number of students who, who volunteered all of these clinics. Um, and at least for the one that I was involved in, there was a lot of um, uh, anger. Uh, you know, we should be able to say when we close and we're willing to take risks and we should be able to do this confusion, like why is this happening? Um, and also fear, how are we gonna take care of our patients? And how are we gonna continue to care for these really vulnerable communities who wouldn't seek out other sources for help? Um, And so I saw this as, you know, maybe we can take this energy and do something about it and unite these five clinics. Um, And so I and another student, Sarah, and one of our uh, faculty uh, started working together on on a COVID task force. 
for these um, five student run free clinics, um, thinking that there would be about 10 students or so who would be interested across them. And it turned out that close to 50 students signed up in the first week. Uh, wow. And uh, we were really overwhelmed by this response. Uh, and so we were trying to figure out ways to sort of change this. But what was happening at the same time was classes that were in person were canceled and changed to virtual. And then eventually students were pulled from clinical rotations. So while all of this was accelerating with um, the task force, uh, we didn't even have a chance to start it because everything was accelerating around us. Um, and this early foundational work helped to set the stage for um, when uh, students were finally pulled from clinical rotations um, the second weekend in March. Uh, and um, there started to be discussions among a broader group of, of students and faculty at both the School of Public Health and uh, the medical school of how do we involve students in this response. And so it really grew from that. Um, and uh, we started to brainstorm um, what are the areas that we need student support? How can students actually support safely? Um, we spoke to people who worked in the hospital, who were in communities, um, and tried to figure out what, what are the issues that need to be managed now. And really, uh, the analogy or the metaphor people kept using was we were building the plane while we were flying it. So we, in three days, came up with the structure, the guiding principles, the whole organization wow. called the COVID-19 Student Service Corps and released it to um, the two schools in a webinar and had, um, I think there were 500 people who signed up in like Ooh. the first 24 hours. We had 1,300 who were signed up in a week. There's been close to 2,000 people that have signed up to volunteer across the now three months that it's existed. Um, and it's it's been an incredible organization, but it was really about channeling that that student anxiety about I came to a health profession school because I want to help and in this moment in which help is most needed I'm being pulled away from the ways the only way I know I can help and and I wanted to more than anything be able to give them an opportunity to do something positive um, in such a difficult time. I've often wondered how you know medical students in their clinical rotations felt about being pulled from those rotations? I mean, did you feel that, okay, they're, they're protecting me, but this is kind of what I signed up for as when I decided to become a physician, or did you feel they were doing the right thing? What, did, you know, what was your reaction? I think there's a lot of conflicting thoughts that happen because I think people understand multiple sides of it. Um, yeah. For me, I wasn't on a clinical rotation at the time. I was actually in my like residency boot camp, which was supposed to involve a lot of in-person simulations um, and like procedures and getting us ready for residency. Um, but I was pulled out of the, the free clinic and, and many of my friends were pulled out of their rotations. And I think there were thoughts of frustration on both sides, thinking this is what I'm here for. I am more trained than I'll ever be as a medical student. They should let me be in the hospital. To, why am I still in the emergency department when there's already cases? I should be pulled from my rotation. I shouldn't be forced to be here. Mm -hmm. um, to uh, people understanding that their presence in the hospital meant more PPE was being used. To people saying, you know, like I'm young and healthy. I should, you know, be someone who's, who's risking exposure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so there were all these things swirling around. And I think that's part of what's made it COVID is so difficult. I, you add on that there's also the clinical burden of many patients don't do well. But um, I, I think it's because people understand the different sides of it. Like there's the medical side, the medical student side, the public health side. Liability. Um, yeah, the liability. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of issues, the student safety. Even for our organization, it took us a long time before we can approve anything that was in person, non-clinical related, because it, there's issues about how do you make sure that someone's not feeling coerced to do something in person and that there's appropriate safety precautions that are at play. And so um, I, I, you know, I've moved on from the organization. I know that there's, at least the medical students are back and some of them are back in clinical work now, but, but building those systems to be able to track, you know, student health was, is new and novel um, in, in such an outbreak. So there was a lot of, of moving, confusing, conflicting parts on behalf, I think of, of many students. I think all citizens around the world have, yeah. have experienced a lot of confusion, conflicting instructions and conflicting emotions. Um, you know, and I would assume that it's exacerbated if you're in a clinical role or in a vul and or in a vulnerable population. It could be both, obviously. Um, Absolutely. And, and I think um, one thing that's, that's interesting this is a bit of a tangent, but um, 
that, that I, I came to find over the couple months. You know, I, I was very involved in a process that was very um, active in the COVID response. Sure. Um, and yet I felt very guilty because I wasn't there. I'm trained to be someone in, as a medical provider who can be at the bedside. And I knew that even if I was the least skilled person in the hospital with the least amount of experience, I could at least provide some sort of emotional support for a provider or a patient if I was physically there. And so I harbored guilt for the fact that I couldn't be there. And I remembered expressing this um, to some, we had some reflection groups and I was expressing this to someone who was a primary care physician. And she said, I have guilt too, because I'm working from home and I know friends who are in the tents who are screening patients. And she said, and I spoke to my friend who's in the tent and they have guilt too, because they're not in the ICUs. And the ICU doctors are guilty too, because they could be exposing their loved ones. And so there's just this, such pervasive feelings of, of deep emotional agony um, that came about from this crisis. And, and I think it's gonna take a long time to repair it, but I really think it speaks to the, the true um, you know, reasons why all of us got in there, got into these professions is that we just want to help in any way possible and, and, and to not be at our fullest, to not be able to save, to not be able to care for people in, in any capacity we can dream of may eat at us a little bit. And, and we have to approach that and own it and, and talk about it. Right. So getting back to CSC, CSSC, is it, is it mostly for med students or is it for undergrads also? Is it for a variety of healthcare fields? How has it developed? So it started, um, it started within the medical school and it's, uh, the, the board that runs it is primarily in the medical school and the School of Public Health. Mm -hmm. um, it, it spread to the schools within the medical center. Um, so that included nursing, dental, medical, um, public health, uh, occupational therapy, physical therapy, social work. And then it, it has since, I believe, I, I, I did leave about a month ago, so I'm not as up to date, but it did okay. spread to um, some of the undergraduate um, and, or the undergraduate and graduate campuses outside the medical center. So obviously- but it's, it's still Columbia, right? It is all still Columbia. Um, Have other universities contacted you like to see, can they copy the model? Absolutely. So we, we started um, and we created this toolkit, which really took those guiding principles that, that we, we came up with. Uh, and we sent this toolkit out. I think it was actually sent out from our dean to every medical school and we posted it on a website. And um, I know the students were informally sending it around to other students we knew at different schools. Um, and to date, there's been... I believe nine or 10 other schools, both undergraduate and graduate who have formed their own COVID-19 student service corps. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, a number of others, I think we were contacted by 30 or 40 different schools um, all over the world, uh, many schools, but asking about how we, maybe not adapting the full model, but asking you know, to learn from it or how we talk through how we did approach different, different problems. Um, and, and I think you know, we created this not expecting that everyone would become a CSSC all over the country um, because everyone was responding at the same time. But if it could help some universities or organizations come together and organize the way that they responded, we thought it would be useful. Um, and so there's, uh, we, there was the, my, one of my last things I did before I, I left my role was I, I joined in on a call of uh, CSSC student leaders from across the country. And um, it gave me chills. It gives me chills now to think about it, to hear about all of the incredible things that these um, students and organizations are doing um, in Arizona and Washington and DC and, and you know, all over. That was gonna be my next question. What are some of the universities that have copied it? Yeah, so uh, one of the first ones was um, University of Washington. The, uh, that was a, a medical school, graduate uh, school. Sure. Form. Um, and then the University of North Carolina uh, as well. Um, George Mason University and the University of Virginia were two undergraduate schools. Um, there's the University of Florida. Uh, University of Arizona in Phoenix, um, the College of Medicine there. They have a very cool program where they've been working with the Navajo Nation to uh, fly in supplies um, that are donated. So a lot of sharing of ideas of how different projects were run and then running with it for one's own local uh, sort of environment. Um, I, there's a number of other schools I think I'm forgetting, but uh, it's been that's really- fine. That's fine. That's very impressive. Yeah. Thank you. The, I know one of the questions we get most frequently, which is one of the reasons I was very interested in interviewing you, is 
my internship got my, my volunteer position got canceled or whatever I was going to do got canceled. And I want to volunteer clinically. I want to volunteer clinically because that's what I want to do. And I want to do it because I need it for my application. So I think it's really important that, that people know about the example that you and the CSSC have set. Cause it means that if your internship or whatever got canceled, there are other avenues. There are other ways to go. I 100% agree. I think that um, some of it comes down to expectation setting. Um, I mean, even for medical students, clinical opportunities are pretty sparse right now. Um, and, and that's pure, that's not because anyone's trying to take them away. That's purely from an infection control standpoint yeah, and a safety course. standpoint. And so I think um, the traditional opportunities that people do in, in getting ready for medical school may not be available for quite some time. Um, and, and many of the things that are needed may be remote and may, they may, many of them may be non-clinical and that's all okay. Um, I think it's looking for organizations and for people that speak to you, uh, and, and reaching out to them to see what you can do to help. Because I think ultimately it's, it's being willing to do what's needed in a time of crisis is the thing that's most important, um, when looking to do something over the summer. Um, I think, you know, if you're thinking about something like the, the Student Service Corps, it's a larger organization, the kinds of things that, that needed to be filled in, in, at least in our organization, I would assume similar organizations, there's a big need for tutoring um, and then for um, like some sort of summer replacement, now that a lot of summer camps are being closed, something mm -hmm. to keep, um, uh, you know, children and, and young adults captive um, when they're still at home or outside. Um, there's many organizations that need support. I mean, now we talk about a lot of the protests that are going on and there's a lot of um, support that can be done there in terms of um, water and supplies and supporting the movement, of course. Um, but I think it's, it's looking local, it's looking where you are, looking to see where the needs are and then looking to see where you may have um, institutional connections through your undergraduate, um, who are the people that have been involved and what opportunities may they know um, and what organizations uh, are, are around you, like a Red Cross or, or something that, that could use some help. Local hospitals. Absolutely. Absolutely. How did you manage the time demands of all these other things that you were doing as well as medical school? Well, you know, the, the caveat to the, the Student Service Corps is I had pretty much finished everything else in medical school, so I didn't have much else going on, so I was able to do that. That said, it was a pretty crazy time commitment, especially in the first few weeks. I mean, I was working um, anywhere from 16 to 18 hour days, like six mm. and a half to seven days a week. Um, it thankfully calmed down a lot in the, in the latter half, but for the first, like even eight weeks or so, um, I was working most days and most waking hours. Um, the other stuff, I mean, it kind of, medical school goes in waves. Um, the time that you have to, to do other things varies. So in the classroom phase, there's usually more time. Of course, there's little mini waves as you have exams and different things come up. Uh, during the, the first clinical portion, that's when you typically don't have a lot of time. And ironically, that is the time where um, having those brief moments of time to do things for yourself is most important. Right. Um, and then after that, it varies again. It depends on what you're doing. In the public health year, I had a lot more free time again, um, time for myself to do other activities. That's when I took up a lot of the public health commute work. Um, and then the residency application process and interviewing took up time because I was traveling um, so it's finding those, those, those dips in the waves where there's more time to do other things um, and taking advantage of that time. Uh, and recognizing, I think again, it's kind of expectation setting, it's recognizing that there will be periods where you don't have time and being able to let go of trying to do all the things. I think that was a really tough transition from college to medical school is you can't do everything anymore in, in, in medical school. You have to be able to let things go and transition them. Uh, and, and I think that was a, an important thing to learn. Right. And again, I mentioned earlier that one of the most common questions I get is uh, from applicants whose volunteer experiences were canceled. Let's say they, they get the volunteer experience, whether it's joining a student service corps or calling up their local hospital or tutoring or whatever it is. How do you advise applicants to use these volunteer experiences, not only to help their communities, because I think service should be at least a partial motivation for these activities, but also to test their interest in specifically medicine or teaching or whatever it is they're involved in. Yeah, I, I think um, 
the testing the experience of medicine is the hard part right now. Right. Right. Um, and I, I don't know. I, I think if there's no replacement for being a part of clinical visits, which, which there may not be for some time, um, then I think honestly, it's just finding people to talk to about their experience. Um, I think uh, finding other people who are in the same process too, and talking and reflecting on, you know, what's it like to be in this process right now and, and, and taking space to write it out and speak about it. Um, I found that to be helpful and just in medical school in general to reflect on um, what I am doing in the time actually makes me more aware of how I feel about all of those aspects. And, and I think that could be useful in helping to explore what one thinks about medicine. Um, you know, that's, it's kind of a escape answer from the fact that there may not be in-person clinical activities. Right. right. Um, you know, and I think there's a lot of things that are clinically related that, that um, you don't think about very often. Care of uh, the elderly is very clinical. Like a, a lot of what we do in medicine is, is simply talking to people and helping them understand things. Um, because, you know, medicine is just a totally different language. Uh, and so um, you have to be able to translate that. Um, and then add that on top of a, an aging population, a lot of isolation and loneliness that's happening oh, yeah. in COVID, um, distance from families, and to be able to be a support for, um, for families, for people who are in need, for people in nursing homes and, and assisted livings, I think is really important. I don't know what opportunities are out there, but I think it's something that's service related, um, that is a volunteer work, but it maybe isn't seen so much as clinical, but has a really important significance. And, and I think mm -hmm. building on that empathy and and those interpersonal connections are, are just as much about medical school as, you know, seeing a surgery. Right. Now, how do you see your career evolving? evolving? You're just about to start your residency at Montefiore. Um, so I realize that you're kind of at the beginning of the next stage, but you also are doing a very interesting residency in the sense that you're not just doing internal medicine, uh, you're doing social internal medicine. So what is that? Again, how do you see things developing? Yeah, it was an interesting career path for me. I, uh, Columbia doesn't have a lot of primary care exposure. Um, it's, a, it's a big specialty hospital. And, and um, so I didn't fully grasp my interest in, in what I wanted to do until I um, really was in my public health year uh, and saw that the intersection of medicine and public health that I was looking for is really happening at the, um, that on the ground level of, of primary care work. Um, and so that opened my eyes to the experiences that I loved the most in medical school, which were this free clinic where I was a primary care doctor and then my primary care and internal medicine rotations. Um, internal medicine is a really big field. You could absolutely go to an internal medicine program and come out the other side and be a primary care doctor. Um, but I knew from the outset that um, I wanted to do primary care medicine. And so when I was exploring residency programs, I looked at both the traditional internal medicine programs and also the primary care ones. Um, and the primary care ones offered things that to me felt really important. So instead of elective time in something like um, doing colonoscopies with a gastroenterologist, that time would be spent more in the clinic or dedicated to learning about um, something called motivational interviewing. So, you know, how you speak with a patient to elicit their motivations about some habit. Um, smoking cessation is a big example of that. And, and that felt more important for what I wanted to do in the future than uh, using that time in, in some other clinical subspecialty. Um, and then I think there's a benefit to being among like a like-minded population of people who know the other career opportunities within the primary care world. Social medicine is really a, an extension of that um, in that it's taking the lens of health equity and social justice and social determinants and really reinforcing it within primary care. I think the best way I've been able to describe it is that it is itself the manifestation of public health and medicine together. Um, it is the fact that you cannot be a physician in primary care without understanding what community and population health is and what the risk factors are for disease that are the not 10% of things that you can cure with medicine, but the 90% of things that come from elsewhere. Um, where you live, the color of your skin, the way you're treated, the language you speak, um, the you know, food around you, the, the smoking and the taxes, all of that. All of those are things that affect people's health that are not traditionally medicine. Um, and uh, this program I felt better than um, anywhere I was really considering going um, 
was the embodiment of the doctor that I wanted to be who would, who would really tackle those issues. So as I look forward to my career, I think that I, would, I love patient care and I want to see patients um, and to be able to do that a couple days a week and be able to do more systems level public health work, the other few um, would really put those together, I think, in a good way. Okay, great. Thank you. Very interesting uh, trajectory that you see yourself on. Um, what would you have liked me to ask you? That's a great question. <laughs> Um, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily a question to have asked me. Okay. Um, but I think when I look back on my time as an undergraduate, um, with always having that lens of wanting to go to medical school, uh, I did things because I enjoyed them, but I knew in the back of my mind that I was also doing it for my application. And, and it, it like still bothers me a little bit. I wish I had truly done things just solely for the pleasure of it because I know now that it didn't matter that I knew it was for my application or not because so many people go on and do amazing things and then go into medicine. And, and I think that um, it, it almost held back my, my full ability to enjoy some of those experiences because I was so caught up on going to medical school. And, and I think something I've seen over the you know five years is that more and more people are taking time off from, from uh, between college and medicine uh, because there's so much to life to experience. And I'm lucky I got to do a lot of that in college, but I think it's okay to enjoy things that you don't see as medically related just because you enjoy them. Uh, and if that means you're not gonna do the, the thing that you're told, you know, you have to volunteer in this capacity or you have to shadow all these things and you do it maybe like a year later than you otherwise would have and you take some time off, that's fine because I think it makes you a better doctor. And I, I truly believe that doing things not related to medicine, doing things in the arts, in languages, in, in literature, whatever it is, dance, sports, they all make us better people and being a better person makes us a better doctor. That is actually, when I ask this question of either residents or graduating or medical students, that's actually one of the more common responses to it. Well, there, you, I didn't put it in a question form, but... No, you know. no, I think, it, you know, the question is, what would you have done differently, really, in, in college or in preparing for medical school? And you pretty much answered it. Um, that, but I've, I've heard that response so many times. Either I'm very glad I, I made time for myself, even as a pre-med, not to mention as a medical student, but, or I wish I would have done, done that more. That's, that's actually one of the more common responses I get to that question when I'm talking to medical students and, re, and younger doctors. So I think it's an excellent point. Do, do you regret not having taken a gap year? No, and I think that um, in a lot of ways doing public health was my quote unquote gap. And, and I say that not because it was, I, I think there's this misconception that a gap year is just like, oh, relaxing. Um, sit on the beach. <laughs> right, right. And in reality, I think a gap year is taking a mental break from all of the science and all of the pressure. Um, and so doing the public health year was really just all about immersing myself in these incredible, with incredible peers and these topics that related so much to my passions. Um, so I don't regret that at all. I think it was more of a mindset in college. I think um, it was the constant pressure of like, you know, how is this going to affect my med school? Yeah. Yeah, um, sure. The treadmill. Yeah. I wish I could have, you know, lived a little bit more in the moment. In, in right. That. Jennifer Welch, who's the, uh, I think, assistant dean, associate dean of admissions at SUNY Upstate. She said that she likes to call the gap year a growth year. Yeah. And I think it's a much better term for it, as long as that's how one uses it. 100%. Um, uh, but in, in terms of your, your comment about, you know, life, somebody says my life is what happens when you're planning to do something else or something, something along. So there's some quote, like, I can't even remember who it is, but life is happening and you should enjoy it. Pursue your goals, but also make time for something you enjoy, something you consider important. Uh, make time for yourself. I think it's an excellent point. And I want to, I want to thank you for sharing that. I think we're just about out of time. And again, David, thank you for sharing your impressive story and squeezing in this interview just before you start your residency. I'm sure this leisure time is very, very precious to you. Where can listeners learn more about the CSSC? 
So you can find information about the, the COVID-19 Student Service Corps at Columbia online at ps.columbia.edu forward slash CSSC. You can also Google the COVID-19 Student Service Corps at Columbia. Right. And we're also going to link to the COVID-19 Student Service Corps as well as the Public Health Commute and other resources related to this podcast from accepted.com slash 374. Listener, I want to thank you too for joining Dr. David Elliman and me for Mission Straight Talk's 374th episode. And now I have a final reminder and a favor to ask. Don't miss Accepted's rollback, which starts on July 15th and ends on August 21st. Then it's back to 2020 pricing. Go to exhibit.com, choose the category and service that's right for you, and then just place that service in the shopping cart to pay what you would have paid in 2017. And the favor. If you find the show worthwhile, please tell a friend about Admission Straight Talk. They'll thank you, and so do I. Thanks again for coming. This is Admission Straight Talk, produced by Accepted, and I'm your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. Bye.